Hi, it's Grace here on Books and Cooks, and I'm here today to do just a little bit of a wrap-up video. So in January, I did a bunch of reading, and primarily I ended up reading nonfiction books. There were five nonfiction books that I read in the month of January, and they were some of the best books that I read the entire month. So I figured instead of doing like a full month wrap-up, which personally I find kind of boring to make at this point, I would just talk to you about the nonfiction books specifically that I read in January because they were such a highlight of the month. I'm just going to take you through the books in order. So the first one that I read was originally from the library, but I ended up purchasing a copy because I really thought that this was an excellent book and I wanted to make sure I had a copy of this in my home. And this was The Stonewall Riots Coming Out in the Streets by Gail E. Pittman. And this book is actually a children's book. So I think it's for kids like 10 and up, maybe. I don't think it says here, but it's definitely a children's book. It's a children's nonfiction book about the Stonewall Riots. But even more than just being about the Stonewall Riots, it's about queer history within the United States and specifically the movement for civil rights for queer people in the United States. And I just thought this was a really well done book, very, very good in terms of an introductory history book and covering a topic that I've personally not learned a lot about in terms of the history of this, which is interesting because I spent, I feel like in my childhood, I spent a lot of time learning about the civil rights movement in terms of, um, the movement for rights for people of color and like black people in the United States specifically and also about the women's movement quite quite a good amount um the kind of the second wave feminist movement of the 1960s and I think that queer history and the, the civil rights movement when it came to queer people in particular is something that I never really got the same education on. And so it was really interesting to go back and look at this um, and learn about it at this point as an adult. So I think this book also is really effective because it takes a very tangible approach to teaching this history. Every section basically highlights a specific object, like a historical artifact from this time. So here we have object number 20, arrest record for Dave Van Rock. And then in the book, you get like pictures of the object. So this is the pictures of the arrest record. And then there is... A, uh, basically like a section that's written about the object. And so Gail E. Pittman takes you through a history of this time that is very solidly connected to specific artifacts that we have. And then she describes like the surrounding events and kind of the context for the Stonewall riots um, through these artifacts and then through different types of like first person uh, memories or records of the experience of different kinds. So not only does it teach you about this like piece of history, this time in history and this particular piece of our history that I think has sometimes been lost in our discussions of these move the movements of this time, but she really makes it very concrete in this interesting way and also I think debunks some of the myths surrounding the Stonewall riots at the same time. It's a very very accessible book so if you look at it like big print, um, large spacing, it's certainly a book that's designed for kids, for young readers, but because of that, I think this is such a great book that I would recommend to adults who maybe don't read a lot of nonfiction or um, don't necessarily like history books specifically because it is so grounded in the history of these objects that I feel like it just 
teaches you a lot about effective storytelling of history, right? And different ways that we can use information to kind of piece together a picture of something that maybe wasn't always well documented historically, if that makes sense. So I love this book, would highly recommend it because I felt like it was just such a good, effective nonfiction experience. After that, I read Waiting to be Arrested at Night, a Uyghur poet's memoir of China's genocide which is by Tahir Hamot Izgil. And this is exactly what it says on the tin. So this is a memoir by a Uyghur person. He is a poet. And if you don't know about the Uyghur people, they are basically like, I believe, ethnic Muslim peoples who currently live in modern day China, but were essentially like colonized and Currently, there is an ongoing genocide by the Chinese government and the use of technology is a really huge part of this genocide. And so it is something that is like pretty intense to read about because a lot of the information is being kept really under wraps and people are not able to uh, share the information on the internet or kind of get it out there in the way that we've seen with some other groups of people who are being oppressed at this time. So it's something that I think is maybe a little bit lesser well known uh, on the internet, at least for people who are just kind of becoming aware of these things. I wanted to pick up this memoir because I don't know a ton about it. I, I've known that it's been an ongoing issue. I know that this has been happening in China and I've read about it, but I didn't know really like the details of what was going on. So I was intrigued by this. I saw this come in at my library and I wanted to pick up a copy. And I think this was definitely a memoir that I would recommend to people who want to learn more about the subject. It's also very nicely written. It is translated, I believe it's translated from um, Uyghur maybe? I, I don't know exactly what language this poet writes in necessarily, it might be Chinese, um, but it was translated by Joshua L. Freeman and because the author is a poet, it, it was just very nicely written, very evocative, very scary at times, um, pretty intense. He was able to get himself and his family out of the area um, kind of at the last minute before a lot of things sort of got completely shut down and people were being put into, imprisoned in large numbers and arrested for really any type of activity that put them on the radar of the Chinese government. So definitely an intense subject, but something that I would recommend that people do educate themselves about and are aware of uh, that this is like an ongoing thing that China is doing at this time. After that, I read a Christmas gift that I got. I was so excited to read this book. This is Let's Get Physical, How Women Discovered Exercise and Reshaped the World by Danielle Friedman. And this was one of my favorite books of the month. I thought that this was such a good look, an interesting look at a very specific slice of history and how it relates to women's rights and specifically our rights to exercise and to do things with our bodies publicly and you know within the realm of like sport and physical activity it's kind of an interesting and like weird thing to say that out loud because it's such a normal part of my life I've never grown up in a world where that was not possible for me to do but it's really interesting through this book learning how recently in our past it was so discouraged that women participate in any type of physical activity really. Every chapter kind of covers like a different type of exercise or a different famous person that's related to that exercise or a few people that are related to it. So it covers things like bar and jazzercise. Um, it talks a little bit about women getting into running and marathons and um, the fight to be able to participate in marathons 
it talks about yoga and there the author does a nice job of um, discussing and commenting on the intersections of different uh, women's experience. So she does bring in examples of black women, um, different women of color, and how their experience was even different from the white women who are trying to kind of exert more control over their bodies and their physical lives. And yeah, overall would very highly recommend, especially if you're someone who appreciates that you do get to move your body. I found this honestly like pretty inspiring and fun to read. I also think it, this is not something that's in the text, but it got me thinking a little bit differently about the fights over trans people and their ability to participate in sports. I am, you know, I, I definitely have had problems with these bills that have come out that are trying to keep people from participating in sports who are trans. Uh, I think it's they're pretty ridiculous bills, but I hadn't thought about how bad that is really, I guess, to control people's ability to participate in physical exercise and activity and how tied it is to social control in general of the body. And this book really gave me, I think, different like language or frameworks for thinking about that. So it just like, it just opened my mind a little bit more to the issue at the heart of these fights. And I think it also gave me some like historical examples as to why this is actually a big deal. And we shouldn't be able to control what certain people can do with their bodies because it is it kind of extends to the entirety of their lives. I don't know, it just got me thinking about that in an interesting way. After that, I read Sisters in Hate, American Women on the Front Lines of White Nationalism by Sayward Darby. And I really appreciated this book. This book is one that I had to pick it up at the right time and it was very much a book that made me really uncomfortable, upset, um, kind of freaked out a little bit to read because it profiles three different women who have become or are still involved in white nationalism um, and white supremacist movements in the United States. And it really did a good job of, I think, like illustrating some of the experiences that pulled the women into these movements, the things that they were looking for within these movements, and the things that they are benefiting from finding in these movements. And the three women that Sayward Darby really focuses on are three very different kinds of characters. And so it was just interesting to see the author kind of unravel the way that they kind of came into these beliefs and then some of them have left um, that belief system at this point and are trying to kind of like undo some of what they had done previously and some of them are extremely still involved in the movement and really essential for the movement to kind of like continue and have uh, I would say like almost a a gentler face to it in a lot of ways, which is really, really, really creepy, but very important, I think, to read about these things. There was just some interesting discussion of how like eating naturally and farming and like getting into yoga and some things that personally I like to do <laughs> with my personal life were all kind of like pipelines to white, white supremacy. And um, so being aware of that, like having that awareness that those places can be pipelines to white supremacy and then being able to kind of like challenge that more effectively was sort of, you know, one of the things I wanted to get from this book, especially this year when we're in an election year and this kind of rhetoric is just getting stronger and grosser <laughs> all the time, unfortunately. The last nonfiction book that I read in January was also one of my favorites. It was a five-star 
Very excellent. And this is a very short work called Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Y. Davis. I think this was written in the early 2000s potentially published in like 2003. So it's a bit of an older nonfiction work, but it is a great introductory philosophical text that kind of discusses some of the major issues with the prison system, the criminal punishment system in the United States, and posits the idea that prisons themselves are an obsolete concept that we are, have grown out of that have outstayed their welcome and cannot be reformed at this point that a, an approach to prison reform is essentially just creating a better prison quote unquote and um the book really kind of makes an argument for prison abolition specifically as the way to kind of move forward in the future. If this is a topic that's newer to you, I think, if, if this is something that maybe you've like heard a little bit about it, you've heard someone say they were a prison abolitionist, or maybe you've heard about uh, police abolition, which is, I think, an overlapping concept. I think that this book does a really great job in each successive chapter of explaining like the history of prisons in the United States, how what was once kind of a reform in and of itself from a system that used like physical punishment or the death penalty, um, public execution as punishment for crimes to what was supposed to be um, a gentler system of kind of like restraining people in one space and then reforming them over time has through largely through capitalism and through kind of a, a cultural obsession with crime and punishment over time has become this like massive really disgusting system where at this point two million people are imprisoned in the United States pretty wild to think about that that is in my state we have about a million people <laughs> in the whole population so it's like two New Hampshire's worth of people that are currently imprisoned in the United States. Angela Y. Davis does take you through a lot of the different problems with the prison industrial complex and with the, the carceral punishment system in and of itself, the idea of incarceration and the ways that it doesn't actually work in the way that it su is supposed to work and also um, has become kind of a tool of capitalism and a way to essentially extract slave labor from people who are imprisoned in the United States and also how we've exported our prison system to the world at this point. And it's become this massive kind of sprawling thing throughout the world. Pretty horrifying. And this is, again, this is as of like 2003. So in 2024, it is arguably even much worse. Very, very good book, solid theory, definitely something I would recommend for someone who's either starting out or wants to kind of expand their own thinking around prison abolition, or for someone who um, is interested in exploring Angela Y. Davis, I do think this is an, a pretty accessible entry point. And also, if you're already reading Freedom is a Constant Struggle, which I know is on a lot of reading lists these days because of its relevance to what's going on with the Palestinian people, I think that this book expands her thinking that is kind of like broached in some of those speeches in Freedom is a Constant Struggle and goes into a lot more depth and a lot more uh, information about the prison industrial complex. So that was my reading in January. Lots of serious stuff and I actually really enjoyed it. I've been in the mood for kind of serious nonfiction. I don't know, my brain has just been wanting that lately 
And so I'm continuing on the nonfiction trend. I've already finished one nonfiction book on cryptocurrency and casino capitalism so far in February, and we're just at the beginning of the month. So I may do a similar kind of wrap up in, for February where I kind of talk about some of my top books, but just wanted to give you an overview of these books. I hope that you're doing well and I hope you have a good one. Bye.